Hey there, welcome to the YouTube channel. I pray that this message encourages you and it helps you grow and become more like Jesus. And make sure you hit the subscribe button so you can continue to grow and learn more. Enjoy. I'm so glad to be with you today and have this opportunity to share. I'm just going to hop right into uh, our message for today. And, and this message started that really a long time ago. I, I did a, a Bible study. It was on missions. And one of the topics for the study was that God was passionate about his name. And it really stuck with me. And so for us today, our, the topic for our message today is God's great name. And God's name is great indeed. And so it made me start to think, what's so important about a name? What, what's, what's that all about? And so we open up with our first scripture for today is Proverbs 22.1. Proverbs 22.1. And it reads, a good name is more desirable than great riches. To be esteemed is better than silver or gold. A good name is more desirable than great riches. To be esteemed is, is better than silver or gold. So there is importance to a name. In fact, we're known by our names. We, people form their opinions based off of, of our names. It does. And so the things we do matter. The things that we do for ourselves, it matters for ourselves, it matters for our families, it matters if we're part of an organization, if we're employed somewhere, it matters to a, a, the church that you're associated with. And so it's, it's false to say that if I do something, it only affects me. And sometimes we hear that. It's like, well, it's my business, it doesn't have anything to do with anybody else. That's not true. It affects our family, it affects everybody that we associated with it because there's something attached to our, our name. A name is more than just a label. It's more than just a heading. It has actually a reputation that's attached to it. And based off our behavior or performances in the past, it's all associated. It's, it's all connected. And there was a gentleman, I, I saw this article by a gentleman named Tim Simcox. And the title of the article was, For My Name's Sake. And he shared this, this message, or he gave a description about the importance of a name. And it says, God's name extols his character, his integrity, his reputation, holiness, and even his glory are all closely linked to his name. And I'll say that again. It says, God's name extols his character, his integrity, his reputation, holiness, and even his glory are closely linked to his name. So when we think about God's name, it's more than just his name. It's his character, who he is. It's so much more. And so God is really zealous. He's zealous for his name. And in fact, he mentioned here that 15 times God said, for my name's sake, I'm going to do something. For my name's sake. So for us today, we're going to look at three examples of why God's name is, is great today. And we'll start out with the first one. The first one is, there is salvation in God's great name. There is salvation in God's great name. God is zealous for his name because people are being saved in his name. And we find in Isaiah 43, 11, we find this passage. This is God speaking here. He says, I, yes, I am the Lord, and there is no other Savior. There is no other Savior. This is God saying, there is no other, there is no other answer for life. There is no other way for salvation. It's me. It's me. 
People are turning to God's great name for the help they need. So God is zealous. He's very zealous for his name. And you know, even if somebody doesn't know God or doesn't have any experience with God, they hear. They hear about what God has done. They hear about how he has changed somebody's life. They hear about how he has has healed somebody, and they're drawn. They're drawn to that great name. They are. We find this passage in Isaiah 48, verses 11 through 13. It says, I will rescue you for my sake. Yes, for my own sake. I will not let my reputation be tarnished. I will not share my glory with idols. God's not going to do that. He's not going to let his reputation, his name, be tarnished. And we're familiar with the the Ten Commandments. And the third commandment has, it goes right along with this. The third commandment says, you should not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord would not leave him unpunished who takes his name in vain. And that's Exodus 20, verse 7. And there's different commentaries on on this verse, but I found um, some content in the Dictionary of the Old Testament that I really believes it captures this, and and a lot of commentaries went along with that as well. And I found this this statement about this third commandment. It says, using God's name in vain involves associating God with purposes and powers that are not, that are inconsistent with God's identity and will. The end result is a misrepresentation of God a false claim to divine power and endorsement, and a miscommunication of the truth. And I want to read that again because I believe it's really important. It said, using God's name in vain involves associating God with purposes and powers that are inconsistent with God's identity and will. The end result is a misrepresentation of God, a false claim to divine power and endorsement and a miscommunication of truth. So when God's name is misused, it misrepresents, misrepresents him. It misrepresents his identity, his will, or even what he endorses. Sometimes we can say, hey, I, you know, I believe this is okay, but does it line up with what God says? There's a misrepresentation there. And God wants all the nations of the earth to know that he, who he is. He wants everybody to know clearly who he is. That eternal life is found in him. And he will not let his name be misrepresented because help, the help that we need is found in him. And, and on occasions, sometimes people will be in need of help, but they don't always turn to the help they need. And I know personally myself, I've, I've known people who it's pretty obvious, pretty clear of what they need, but they just can't realize it. And it baffles the mind, but that's really something that's spiritual. It has to be spiritually under, understood. But God wants people to know who he is. And he wants that to be clear. And he will not let his name be defiled. And we just finished a a series on evangelism, Pastor Ryan did, and making God's name known. And that is so important because people are finding salvation and they are finding the help that they need in this life and the life to come in God's great name. The second example of why God's name is great is God is holy. God is holy. And we find that Psalms 111, verse 9, it says this, He he provided redemption for his people 
He ordained his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. Holy and awesome is his name. And when you look up the word holy in Hebrew, we find that it's, it means to be sacred or, or set apart, to be set apart. And in this particular case, God is holy and he's set apart from sin. There is no sin in God. There is no sin. And Jesus, we find that in Jesus. Jesus is the only person that ever walked this earth, that ever will walk this earth, that lived a sinless life because he's holy. He's, he alone is the spotless lamb that takes away the sins of the world. That's him. That's who God is. We find in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21, it says, For God made Christ, who never sinned, to be the offering for our sin so that we could be made right with God through Christ. Jesus, never having sinned, God offered him up for our sins that we could be made right with God through Christ. Now, there, was, there wasn't any sin in Jesus at all. And he took on our sins, bore our punishment that we may have life. So Jesus did what no one else could do. No one could do what he did. He brought about the remission of our sin. And we find something that, that goes along with that in Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 24 and 25. We find this passage. It's up on the screen. should be. For Christ did not enter into a holy place made with human hands, which was only a copy of the true one in heaven. He entered into heaven itself to appear now before God on our behalf. And he did not enter heaven to offer himself again and again like the high priest here on earth who enters the most holy place year after year with the blood of animals. Now this is a, a very beautiful passage here. In the former days, the priest would, he'd have to make an offering for his sin every year and for the sin of the people as well. And he'd have to do that every year. He would, he would go to this, this tabernacle. This tabernacle was, was like a, a church or a building or back in that day it was a tent that God had, had Moses make. And he would meet with them in that place. So the priest would go in there year after year. He would go into the most holy place to offer up a sin sacrifice. But don't you know, when Jesus died, when he laid down his life for us, he didn't go to a tabernacle that was made with hands. He went to sit at the right hand of the Father. He is in heaven. So there's a difference, a stark difference between what Jesus did and what God put in place in the Old Testament. And, and sometimes we, we see Jesus as all merciful, a loving God, and we see God as God the Father as more of a rigid, sometimes a overbearing, I guess you would say. I want to stay in the right context, but he's just a, a stickler for what's right. But we forget about in John 3.16 that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. God gave his son because of his love for us. That's who God is in the Old Testament, New Testament alike. And I'll show you this an example because even in the Old Testament, God did not forget about them and their sins. He made provision for their sins to be dealt with. Yes, they had to go year after year because their sin was set aside. 
But God was looking in the future. In the future, he was going to send his son to just do away with sin. But he didn't forget them. And God doesn't forget us. So when Jesus came, he was a perfect sacrifice. Holy. Holy. And so when he came, our sins are not set aside. They are gone. They are done away with. And so one definition that I found for that was that for remission of sin, it says, if the offender is treated as though the offense has never been committed, it's gone. It's cast away as far as the east is from the west. And that's good news for us today, saints. That's good news for us. That is. Because I don't care where we are. We can have a rough week, rough day. This is a pick-me-up. My sins are forgiven. Lord, thank you. Thank you. You don't treat me as my sins deserve. You don't. That's remission of sin. And that's through a holy God. But we have to abide in him. The scripture says that we are to be like God. God is holy. We are to be holy just as he are just as he is, and we have to abide within him because of the sacrifice that he gave for us, we're made right. But we have to abide with him. It's not something that we do on our own. We have to stay in the midst of him. So Jesus is holy, set apart from sin, and he came to give life. So we also could be set apart from sin through the sacrifice that he made. We are set apart. We are set apart because of Christ as we abide in him. The third example of why God's name is great is because there is power in God's great name. There is power in God's great name. Can I get an amen for that one? There is power. In Philippians 2, verses 8 through 11, it says, He humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Therefore, God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. All things are subject to Jesus' name. All things are subject. Demons flee at the name of Jesus. They do. They can't withstand that name. They cannot. Strongholds are broken in the name that, in that great name. I don't care what we're going through. Strongholds are broken in that name. People are healed in the name of Jesus. They're healed in Jesus' name. And I don't know, when you don't know what to say, when you don't know what to pray about your situation, just pray, just say the name Jesus. Just say Jesus. Sometimes that's my whole prayer. Like Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Do you see what's going on? And you know, watch the situation change. Watch it change. And you know what? The situation itself may not change, But somehow, the peace of God starts residing within us because we know that he is greater than whatever we're going through. So there's a peace that overcomes us, and we know that he is faithful. He is faithful. So he's going to work on whatever we're going through. He is going to work on it. And so we give it over to him. But there's power. There's power in that great name. 
John 17, verses 11 and 12. Because Jesus, he prayed for the disciples and he used the name of the Father. And we find that here in this passage in John 17, verses 11 and 12. It says, now I'm departing from the world. They are staying in this world. But I am coming to you, Holy Father, you have given me your name. Now protect them by the power of your name. So they will be united just as we are. During my time here, I protected them by the power of the name you gave me. I guarded them so that no one was lost except the one headed for destruction, as Scripture foretold. When Jesus walked the earth, he was God incarnate, which means that he was God in, in human form. All power was in Jesus. All authority was in Jesus. Yet he humbled himself and he died a criminal's death. And that's because of the love for us. But it didn't diminish his power. It didn't diminish who he was. And we find that in Colossians 1. This verse is not actually on the slide. I want you to turn to Colossians 1, verses 15 through 20. All these notes are on the website as well. So if you want to go back and review them, all the scripture references are there as well. Colossians 1, verses 15 through 20. It says, Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. For through him, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things we can see and the things we can't see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, and authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him. He existed before everything else, and he holds all creation together. Christ is also the head of the church, which is his body. He is the beginning supreme over all who rise from the dead. So he is first in everything, for God in all his fullness was pleased to live in Christ. And through him, God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross, by the shed blood of Christ. God reconciled everything to himself. All power. All authority is in Christ. And God is just reconciling everything to himself, restoring everything, just as he said he was going to do, to himself. When Jesus' disciples received the power of the Holy Spirit, they went about preaching in Jesus' name, telling everybody that, that he had risen from the grave and salvation could be found through forgiveness in Jesus. And you know, the disciples, they were doing the same miracles that Jesus were doing as well. They were laying hands on the sick. Sometimes shadows would even pass by. People were getting healed. They even laid hands on the dead and they, they, they were raised. They were casting out demons. They were doing everything all the same things that, that Jesus was doing because the Holy Spirit was abiding within them. And you know, church, God has not changed. God has not changed. 
He's the same today, yesterday, and forever. He has not changed. So the same, he's the same miracle worker, the same power that Jesus walked the earth with, the disciples laid hands on, that power has not diminished. It has not diminished. And as people of God, as we align ourselves with God or as we set ourselves aside apart for his use, we'll see those same signs and wonders as we do those things in his name, for his will. It's going to happen because God is going to act on his word. He's going to do it, church. And Pastor Brynan, he preached on the need for us to, to have, to be indwelled with the, the, the power of the Holy Spirit. We have to be filled with the power of the Holy Spirit to evangelize. And when the Holy Spirit comes upon us, it's not just for our own personal use. It's not. God is edifying the church or he's, he's, he's building up the church, making it stronger because we have a mission. Our mission is bigger than just here today. This is great, but God has a, a purpose for his church. The church is holy and the church is set aside for a purpose. And that purpose is to make his great name known, church. We have a, we have a purpose. We have a mission. And that should excite us, really. Every one of us, we all need a purpose. We all need... We all need purpose. We all need a, something that's, that's calling us. What are we going to give our lives to? It's more than just the nine to five. It's more than just what we see. And I tell you what, in his great name, we find that. In his great name, we find that. So we have three takeaways today for this sermon. And I'll, I'll hit this those quickly. But as believers in Christ, we are saved in God's great name. We are recipients of his grace. So at some point, we called out and we asked God to come in and abide inside of us. And our sins have been removed. They've been cast away as far as the east is from the west. And the world is looking for that, that same peace. The world is looking for answers. And those can only be found in Christ. They can only be found in Christ. Romans 5, verse 1 and 2. It reads, Therefore, since we have been made right in God's sight by faith, we have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ our Lord has done for us. Because of, our, because of our faith, Christ has brought us into this place of undeserved privilege where we now stand and we confidently and joyfully look forward to sharing God's glory. Because of what Christ has done for us, we are in a place of undeserved privilege. All that grace, that mercy that God has, has given to us. So we have a peace with God because of that relationship we have with Christ. And we're set apart for his use. We belong to him. We do. And Pastor Ryan preached last Sunday, and he talked about how to receive that, that forgiveness. And he talked about it being as simple as, as ABC, and that's true. God made it so simple for us that no one can error, no one can miss this. It's as simple as ABC, and, and the A is to accept that we are in need, that we need forgiveness. Everyone has sinned. There's no perfect person. There was only one per perfect person, that's Jesus Christ. Everybody else fallen that all other category. Believe that Jesus died for our sins. We have to believe that when he died on the cross, he did it for us. 
And third, we have to confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord. And, and when we confess, we mean that, that he is right. Lord, you're right. And I am not. I need you. And that's God's desire for all of us. It's his, it's his desire that none should perish, but all should come to repentance. God is good. He is good. And so when we belong to God, he's able to keep us. No one can snatch us out of his hands. We're in good hands when we're in the Lord's hands. I want you to turn to John chapter 10, and this won't be on a slide either, so you're going to have to to look in the book of John. I'll give you a second. John chapter 10, verses 27 and 30. But this will be on the, the website, though, in the after the sermon notes. John chapter 10. Verses 27 through 30. It says, My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish. No one can snatch them away from me. No one's going to snatch us away from God. For my Father has given them to me, and he is more powerful than anyone. Who is able to bind God? Who is able to keep God from keeping us? No one can snatch them from the Father's hand. The Father and I are one. When we're in God, we're in a safe place. No one's going to take us out of his hands. No one's able to take us out of his hands. The second takeaway for us is that we should ask for things in God's name. And you know, the more we grow in our faith, the more we spend time with God, the things that we want, they, they tend to change. They do. They can be in the beginning sometimes almost like a big, long uh, Christmas list. Roop. Hey, we can, I have all these needs, Lord. And you know, to be honest with you, I have to catch myself with that as well. Okay, okay, Lord, this is all about you. It's not about me. But it's okay to pray for the needs that we have. Because we have them. We need provision. We need healing. We need to grow in our faith. We need to understand God better. He wants those things too. Because he's a good father. But right along with that, we should be praying for other people too. God puts people in our life for a reason. There is no coincidence in your life. And we just, <laughs> there is no such thing as a coincidence. There's no such, no such thing as a, this place you're working at that you may not necessarily care about, but God has you there for a reason. And so while you're there, Lord, why am I here? And he'll show you, like, hey, I want you to pray for this young man here or this young lady here. As we're spending time with him, he shows us those things. I've had times where God would just wake me up to put somebody on my mind. I've heard other people say the same thing. We should be praying for those needs praying for those concerns. We should be praying for the needs that we see within our world. There's lots of prayers. What Dor- Dorothy was saying, we could be here 24-7 for all the needs that we see. There is a lot to pray about church. There is a lot to pray about church. You know just as well as I do. But God's great name, we should be praying for those needs And God hears the prayers of his people. The third takeaway for us today is that we should proclaim his great name to others. Again, we should proclaim his great name to others. I see a lot of faces in here today, and I know watching online as well, God has done great things for us. Just us sitting here is an example of that. I know if you're like me, there's been some close calls in life. You're like, Lord, that could have taken me out. But here we are. And it's because God's faithfulness. And so we should tell people 
what God has done for us. We should let them know that our God is good. Our, our God is, is faithful. In Ephesians 2, verses 10, we find this passage. It says, For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. We are his handiwork. People can't see God, but they can see the effects of God in our life. And we're not just good people, you know. We're set aside for a purpose. There's a difference. We can do a lot of good things. But what makes us tick? Why are we the way that we are? It's because Christ is inside of us working. And people can understand God better when they look and they see that, that we're living a life that fits in with the nature and character of who God is. But at the same time, if we don't, if we don't live a life that lines up with the identity with Christ, it works the opposite direction. In Proverbs 25, verse 26, we find this passage, and we're, we're winding down here. It says, if the godly give in to the wicked, it's like polluting a fountain or muddying a spring. Again, if the godly give in to the wicked, it's like polluting a fountain or muddying a spring. And I, I want you to get this visual, this nice mountain spring. Maybe in Colorado, I heard they got some nice springs. I haven't been there, but it's nice, crystal clear. You know, it's hot outside. You want to drink, take a drink of water, right? Yeah, here. Yeah, I'll share with you. But it's just nice and it's crystal clear. It makes you thirst, makes you, makes you want to take a drink. So I want you to get in your mind, though, that same stream, someone just trotting through it, kicking up gravel and dust, and just all kind of stuff just moving, all kind of particles moving, moving around that stream. No one wants to drink from that. No one wants to put, put their lips on that. So I want an application for, for us today, church. I want us to, to think about that. When we live a life that doesn't represent God's name, his character, because his name is up on us. We belong to him. It confuses people. It confuses them to understand what it means to be a Christian or, or to follow Christ. And I'm not saying that we're perfect. I wouldn't try to put something on the church that I can't keep myself. But I will say that we're perfectible. And what I mean by that is that when, when we mess up, we fess up. When we get something, when we mess up, we repent. And we turn it into a different direction. And we allow God to change us. When God saved us, he didn't leave us the way that we were. Praise God for that, right? We're not the same. We're not the same. And to be honest with you, some people around us, they could tell us sooner than we recognize ourselves. Something's different about you, you know? So we're not the same people because we allow God to change us. We're perfectible. And the world needs to see that more than anything. They need to know that if there's forgiveness and grace for us, there's forgiveness and grace for them. It is. There's grace for them. In that great name. So to sum it all up, God will protect his great name. He's zealous for it because people are being saved in that name. Lives are being changed. He is the answer. God is holy. He's separated from sin, and, and we too should be holy, abiding in Him, Him keeping us. And there's power in that great name.
there's power. And for us, church, that means that God has given us the power to make disciples, to be a witness, to make his name known. Amen. Amen. I want to pray. And at the end, if you need prayer today, we'll have our prayer ministry team come forward. But these altars are always open for prayer. But let's pray. Father, we, we do come before you. And Lord, we thank you for your great name, Lord. We thank you, Father, that although that you're, Lord, you're self-sufficient. That's one of the descriptions of your name, Lord. You don't need anything. But here it is, Lord. You delight in us. And Lord, your great name is upon us, Father. And we're thankful. Help us to represent you, Lord. We thank you for the Holy Spirit that convicts us. And it drives us into changing so we're not the same, that we're perfectible. We allow you to shape us and mold us, Lord. And Lord, if there's, there's anyone here, Lord, who have yet to accept that gift, Lord, it is easy as ABC to accept that they need you, to believe, Lord, that you died for them and just confess that that you're right, Lord. And Lord, if somebody's here today or watching online, Father, I pray they would pray a simple prayer like this, Lord, I need you. I'm not perfect, Lord. I've made mistakes. Lord, I believe that you died on the cross for me simply because you love me. And I don't fully understand that. But help me to. And Father, I confess, Lord, that you are right. And Lord, I'm not. And so, Father, if anybody prayed that prayer, I pray you'd put them in a good place that they can grow and learn of you, Father. And so, Father, for the body of Christ here today, Lord, Lord, I pray that we would proclaim your great name, Lord. Thank you, Father, for your presence of your Holy Spirit, Father. Lord, that empowers us to do that, Lord. And Lord, when we think about you, Father, when we think about how zealous you are for your name, Lord, Lord, I pray there will be a reverence as well, Lord. As we're thanking you for the gift of salvation you're giving us, Lord. And as we look around and see, Father, you are reconciling everything to yourself through Jesus, that shed blood. Thank you for the time we had today, Lord. Watch over us. We go our separate ways, Lord. Thank you for your faithfulness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you, church.